Good morning, everybody. Please take your seats. There's a lot of space towards the middle of the auditorium, so you can always um, ask your friends and colleagues to squeeze in a little bit. I want to remind you to fill out your evaluation. Um, we encourage that you do it in the app and online um, or online. If you do it online, you get two chances to win registration for 2020. Um, there is also a printed version of the evaluation at the hospitality desk to the left when you leave the, um, the auditorium. You only get one chance to win a free registration uh, if you do the printed version. But if you do it online or in the app, it's two chances. Um, this means that, yes, there will be a Plan Forward 2020. As you might know from the 20 worlds of flavor, 16 worlds of healthy flavors, 12 flavor quality American menu, we like to do things for the long run when we start something. So uh, April 22nd through 24th, 2020, we will be back here for more Plan Forward, and we hope that you will be joining us for that. Um, there is the winner of a registration in the audience, so people do win them. It is true. Ian Keith, please wave. You did win a registration <laughs> there. <laughs> um, so we will um, be here in 2020. Before that, um, and I don't see the slide. Oh, no, there's no slide for that. But there are slides in the splash screens that are circulating for menus of change at Hyde Park in June, Worlds of Flavor here in November. You get discounts. So we hope to see you at those as well. Um, that's it for my announcements. I'm happy to welcome back Alison Ryder to the podium. Good morning. Have you guys been enjoying these spotlights so far? Awesome. Okay, so they're fun for me to do too. And I hope I'm also dispelling, I was talking to you, I hope I'm also dispelling the myth that dietitians are just boring and food police and all of that. So there can be foodie dietitians too. So and I know a few dietitians in the room as well. All right, so at this point in the conference, hopefully you have gotten a really good sense of what are the key markers and key actions for developing plant-forward menus. So whole, minimally processed plant foods, reducing and prioritizing certain animal proteins. The third one, and the last one I'll leave you with, is to really consider an increased variety in order to promote biodiversity. So there's a lot of stats that I like to keep in my back pocket when I think about um, just the brokenness of our healthcare and food system. You know, you think of obesity trends, you think of food insecurity, hunger, you think of food waste, which has finally gotten the attention it deserves. So biodiversity is is um, has some really mind blowing statistics as well that I'm going to share with you, and that you hopefully will add to your toolkit of of um, just considerations. So I'm going to leave you with um, three statistics and then three organizations and opportunities for you to get involved here. So 75% of the global food supply comes from only 12 plants and five animal species. Whoa. Um, and then if we look at where our plant-based calories are coming from currently, it's 60% uh, are coming from only three crops, corn, rice, and wheat. And the last statistic here is, this is a, a very um, unbalanced pie chart, of, of the somewhere 20 to 50,000 discovered edible plant species that we have, we're only regularly consuming 150 to 200 of those. So you can see here the opportunity as chefs and, and food service operators to make a dent here. And, and biodiversity is good for the health of the environment. It's, it's uh, you know, the only way that we're going to be on track to feed a growing global population. And I think that biodiversity, if anything, if people don't believe or aren't motivated by health or environment, I think the, the, this is the one underlying piece of, our, of ensuring um, food security into the future. So the three organizations, the first one is the Crop Trust, and this is an international organization based in Germany, and they are, are really the leaders here in um, identifying or working towards this target that the UN put together for the Sustainable Development Goals, um, one of which is, is really promoting um, and, and, and conserving the agricultural biodiversity. So they have this um, campaign called Food Forever. Has anyone heard of this? Okay, a few people. So the Food Forever Initiative, Global Partnership Awareness Campaign to Promote Biodiversity, really awesome website that I highly encourage you to view. They have all these cool infographics and stats and just really compelling storytelling. And so uh, just stats like this, 4,500 different types of potatoes or 1,000 different kinds of bananas. So really cool info there. And one um, action for you all to look into is to join their Chef's 2020 for 2020 campaign. 
that you can go on and commit as a chef to um, highlight certain ingredients on your menu or just become an advocate for promoting biodiversity in one way or another so you can take their survey and, and commit to doing that. And 2020 really was the marker for trying to reach certain uh, metrics for the sustainable development goal. So that's why there is this like sense of urgency and really raising awareness about this now. The second campaign is called Rediscovered, and this is by the Lexicon of Sustainability, another really awesome organization. I believe we have the co-founders here in the audience with us for this conference. And they um, just do an amazing job with the, the storytelling and what they're doing with this campaign is, is highlighting success stories of 25 crops from around the world and really trying to highlight these you know, forgotten crops that are coming back into, um, into our awareness. And the last one is a partnership with NOR and World Wildlife Fund. And this is a Future 50 Foods campaign or report. They published this really awesome report that highlights 50 different foods and, and really gives you the full background of the nutritional uh, you know, information and, and all of the reasons why we should include more of those foods in our diet. So this is definitely one to check out as well. And um, we have the team at Unilever here, the parent company of NOR, uh, with us as well. So in, I will leave you with this final thought that when you think plant forward, also think of biodiversity. And, it, and, and this is really what you're seeing. All of these global cuisines and cultures that we're highlighting throughout the conference here is, is just pre presents a lot of opportunities for innovation and really building resilience for a future. So thank you very much and hope to see some of you for my last uh, breakout session later today. Thank you so much, Alison. You've done a really amazing job with all of these spotlights to give us um, what we need for uh, some scientific food for thought and uh, the, the, the places where we can go dig for more also. So thank you very much for uh, delivering a very impactful message on that. Um, before we go to our next session, um, I'd like to introduce a, a short trailer of a video. Um, as you, some of you know and may have seen, uh, we've had a long-standing series of um, uh, world cuisine um, programs with Unilever where our team goes around the world um, to different locations, spotlights chefs, films them, film, uh, film markets, home cooks, etc. Um, and then also works with Unilever chefs on uh, some of the, 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 the recipes afterwards here. Uh, those are available on YouTube. They were just in Israel a few months ago, um, met Sherelle Berger, who is part of the, the video that you'll see uh, in a minute. And um, obviously, the, the, as we've discussed at length already, the uh, Israeli foodways are very planned forward. So it's very appropriate that we are debuting this video right here. So without further ado, Chad, roll it up.
there we go. So the full series of videos will be launching, as you saw, November 6th, which, which just happens to be the very first day of Worlds of Flavor, where there will be uh, Israeli representation as part of the, uh, the, the chefs coming and the, uh, the demos that will take place. Um, so Israel segues into the, uh, the next session, which also ties back to the uh, graphic that ended uh, Selassie's talk the other day, um, the looking back to look forward, um, how traditionally planned forward cuisines can help shape the future of our menus. And so to take us through this look back to look forward, um, we will be joined by Margot True as a moderator. Margot True has won multiple James Beard and IACP awards. She was the longtime food editor at Sunset Magazine. Before that, she was the executive executive editor at Savar magazine. Uh, she was at Gourmet before that, has edited a number of cookbooks, including uh, The Great Outdoors Cookbook, which was an IACP cookbook of the year. Uh, she also hosted a, a weekly Facebook Live segment for Sunset and uh, now pursues other writing projects, a lot of which are planned forward. So we're very excited to welcome Margot True. Thank you, Anne. Well, I, this is a particular favorite topic of mine. Um, for many years, I've been trying to incorporate this way of eating into my own diet and to into all the writing projects that I pursue, too. Um, and it's, it's so interesting that for thousands of years, we've evolved to eat basically what our ecosystems have to offer, the terrain, the climate. And we're kind of hardwired to be part of our ecosystem, which is eating mainly plants, not a whole lot of meat, except for a few exceptions, of course. Um, so that when we, when we think about ways of eating, this post-industrial era of the past 60, 70 years is really this anomaly, this weird blip. But unfortunately, that blip has had a huge impact on our health and on consequences on every level. It's impacted taste, nutrition, environment, and luckily, the old, rich ways of eating are still patiently waiting for us out there. And we're lucky to have today three cooks and researchers uh, with us who are all experts in their heritage cuisines. And there are tremendous resources in teaching us what we need to know to go back to move forward. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce um, Maricel Presilla, who is the chef and owner of Kuchara Mama and Zafra in Hoboken. And I've known Maricel for a really, really long time. I edited um, her Return to Cuba story when I was at Savur, and we formed a bond over um, you know, roast pig and coffee and cacao and so many other things. And I, I still miss editing her work. Um, she is indefatigable as a researcher. She will pursue details to the end. Uh, she holds a doctorate in medieval Spanish history from NYU. Um, she researched um, Spanish history in Spain, actually, also. Her magnum opus um, a few years ago is Gran Cocina Latina. Several of you may know that indispensable research volume that's been honored as Cookbook of the Year by the James Beard Foundation, Best General Cookbook IACP. She's also uh, been inducted into Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America. She's written about chilies, chocolate, foundational books in both these subjects. And um, she also is the America's Director of the International Chocolate Awards, the, which is a, a, the largest independent chocolate competition in the world. And last night, she was telling me about her work with the International Institute of Chocolate and Cacao Tasting, which leads interested parties into the Peruvian Amazon to taste not just cacao, but all of this, these other kinds of produce from that area to broaden their sense of local flavors and that, how that informs their appreciation of cacao. So please um, welcome Maricel Presilla. Thank you so much, Margo. I really appreciate you. She was my editor, and I've never had a better editor in my entire life. The, the, the good thing about being in the last, the last day uh, of a conference is that uh, you get to have the measure uh, of the talent gathered here. And for me, yesterday, the, uh, the competition, the, um, the challenge in the kitchen was an eye-opener. Um, I was really in awe of the skill and enthusiasm 
for, well, you were in my team, uh, for plant-forward foods. In fact, you know, I just kept eating the food that, you know, the, the people that came to, to work with us in Latin America and uh, in the Latin America and, uh, workshop showed me uh, an understanding of, you know, the ingredients, how they incorporated, no idea. So how many of you were in the blue team yesterday? Fabulous. You know, they, they, they rocked. <laughs> they, they really rock. So I need the clicker now. Yes, I'm showing some slides. So Latin America, plant, a plant forward and flavor forward, which is, you know, very important. The two concepts are completely related. Uh, I'm Cuban, but I'm here to talk about Latin America, which is my, my territory, my turf. Um, and I'm a very proud Latin American. Um, because, you know, I value, you know, our territory, our vast territory as the repository, you know, of great plant diversity. You know, not only do we have incredible food crops um, that are pre-Columbian, but also, you know, we have everything but the kitchen sink in terms of, you know, Mediterranean, uh, you know, vegetables and, you know, even Asian ingredients. Uh, Asian plants that are being grown in, in Peru, Brazil, and other places. So we have it all. Um, and uh, I have great admiration for how the cooks have learned to coax flavor, you know, from a number of, of plant foods, um, most specifically the staple crops. So um, this is a very um, special uh, image for me. It's um, a painting by my father, Ismael Espinosa. Um, he was uh, staying with me uh, like a two years before. This is, no, this is much earlier. But he was staying with me at home in New Jersey. He lives in Miami. He used to live in Miami. And um, he decided to paint uh, a bowl of vegetables, tropical vegetables that I always keep in my kitchen. This is it. And um, so these, these are the staple um, best vegetables and starchy vegetables and tuber crops of the Hispanic Caribbean. You know, these are the things that I cook with, you know, mostly, you know, at home and even at the restaurant uh, on, every, on an everyday basis. Um, when my father uh, was painting this, you know, he was diagnosed with a problem. My husband, who's a physician, said, you can't, you have to stop eating so many starchy vegetables. So my father would have a bowl of boiled starchy vegetables, and you know, like yucca, plantains, and you know, just put olive oil and garlic. And, and that would be a complete meal for him. So he told my husband that he would rather die. And he, you know, if he's, instead of, you know, he couldn't stop, he couldn't stop eating those vegetables, and he meant it. Uh, because these, uh, these vegetables right here, you know, are essentials. And actually the way in which they're called in, in the Hispanic Caribbean, we call them viandas. Uh, you know, if anybody knows the, the translation beyond, it would be like, almost like the French use it for, for meats. Uh, bituallas, which are essentials. Uh, and you go anywhere in Hispanic Caribbean, you go to a farm, you say, what do you eat? Oh, bituallas. So we have everything here. Uh, we have um, the, uh, the yuca, which is essential uh, to the lowlands of the Americas. Uh, we have squash. Um, we have uh, sweet potato. Uh, malanga or yautia, and then plantings that came to the Americas in 1516. You know, so a very long uh, road from Asia uh, to Africa, from Africa to the Canary Islands, and then to, the, to what is today the Dominican Republic. And then they spread all over. And who would say that plantains are not ours? You know, these are our food. <laughs> you know, so in fact, when somebody goes native, we say it's a platanado. He became like the planting. And also we have African yam, which obviously came through the, you know, the nefarious uh, slave trade. Uh, and these things are prepared simply. You know, they're, they're boiled, in some cases they're grilled, like in, in coastal Ecuador. Uh, they're dressed simply with salt, olive oil, or a Cuban mojo. Do you know what mojo is? It's fantastic. It's just olive oil, garlic, some onions, a little cumin, oregano, and you just dress these boiled vegetables. Uh, you know, they're really piping hot, it's fantastic. Or we mash them into a puree that is called fufu. 
And so we have our, our guests from, from Ghana, you know, you know exactly what I, I'm talking about. So you make fufu out of plantains and you make fufu out of yams. So it's very African. It's the way we like our vegetables. But then again, we have the, the eggplants from the Mediterranean, the cauliflower, we have just about everything. Uh, and you just have to remember this picture because these are, the, these are our staple plants. You know, the corn, the yucca, the potato of the Andes. The, the yucca is the primary food of the tropical lowlands. It's sustenance. Uh, and then we have uh, fasciolus, the common beans came from us. Whoever uses beans elsewhere, they owe it to us. Uh, <laughs> you know, tomatoes. Uh, you know, this is Solanacea family, it's amazing. Uh, tomatoes, uh, peppers, avocado, and of course, cacao. But I'm very interested in how these uh, staple crops fit into sustainable agricultural systems. You know, the Spaniards brought the monocrops. They brought the wheat, they brought rice, they brought livestock. But it's just fascinating to see how in communities throughout the Americas, these staple crops grow in a polyculture system and they are, they are the basis of sustainability. So for example, um, you know, I just went with this uh, Amazonian Ecuadorian woman uh, to her field to pick up cacao. But we ended up with corn and with fruits and vegetables and things that she foraged. Um, you know, foraging for uh, sort of fiddlehead ferns that are absolutely fantastic. So this is how we brought them to the kitchen, and this is what the kitchen table looked like. So we cook all that, and most of it was cooked in leaves, which is something that I do, and I think it's very special. You know, you want to cook vegetables, cook them in leaves, and, and just uh, put them on top of a yeah, live you know, wood fire. You know, have several layers, so you, you get the smell, the flavor from the either banana leaves. In this case, they use a lot of bihau, which is a native uh, plant. But then bananas and, or plantain leaves are fabulous. Uh, but imagine all that fruits, you know, the fiddlehead ferns. That's something called pataste, it's a relative of cacao, which is boiled and then they mash it together with hot peppers and they make a sauce. Or they eat it like chestnuts. And it's just remarkable. And they also, again, wrap it in leaves and they broil it. Um, and you, know, you see that how planting now is part of this indigenous diet. This is the Yanomami Indians of Venezuela. So, I mean, fish food is planting soup. So, but that beautiful dish there is not from the Amazon, it's from my kitchen. You know, it's, it's a soup that I made wrapped in plantain leaves. Soup, soup uh, with tubers and different vegetables. Cooked this way on the fire. This is one of the illustrations of my uh, pepper book because it's eaten with pepper sauce. A condiment, you know, adding life to starchy things. There's a lot of yucca there. That lively hot pepper sauce is going to bring, uh, you know, starchy vegetable to life. All right? So, so these are the books that really um, summarize my, my existence and this plant-forward way of life that I enjoy from the Americas. Uh, and preparing for this conference, I realized, you know, how much I owe, you know, to plant eating cultures in Latin America. You know, much more than I, there are more chapters on plants than about, you know, animal protein in, in my books. And, you know, my books, in a way, have been the window into, into a, you know, new life. So this is my group, you know, my uh, chocolate and cacao tasting group, level three. We go to the Ecuador, Ecuadorian uh, Amazon, where I do sensory, you know, and I go to the market and this is what people eat. Um, and that has taken me also to other places like Japan, where I have learned from other sustainable cultures. You know, these are lotus farmers. And I cook with them, uh, mixing Japanese and, uh, and Latin American flavors. So, you know, we get something like that. You know, I make a cacao and chile powder but in this particular case in Japan, I added nori. Uh, I can do some kombu salt with the cacao. So, so these are the things that really matter to me. And, you know, this is my biggest source of inspiration is my garden, you know, where I grow 300 uh, cultivars of capsicums every year and where I get tomatoes and eggplants and everything. So I'm just going to show you very quickly 
two recipes that actually illustrate two or three different ways of adding flavor to, uh, to vegetables. It's very simple. Uh, one of them, the first one, is, you know, it's something very basic. So it's, um, okay, I'm just doing the wrong. <laughs> All right, let's try here. Okay. <laughs> Imagine that going to flames. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a recipe that, that uh, I use at home and also at my restaurants, you know, and it's, um, something that came from my garden, you know, I found this gigantic, like 12 inch zucchini that was, it looked like a log and, um, and I had cherry tomatoes and, uh, I had also, um, capsicum leaves, you know, that you can use the pepper leaves instead of cherry, to, in, instead of, um, sorry, pear, parsley or cilantro. Uh, it's just very, very tasty. So, um, the, the, the ba basic way of flavoring vegetables in most of Latin America is using a sofrito. And you all know what sofrito is, right? So you get, you know, the base is, well, it could be a number of different fats, and, but I use olive oil. So, so this is a very uh, simple sofrito with um, just you know, regular Spanish yellow onions, some garlic, and what I call the DNA of my my cooking, I use allspice because that's what we use in Eastern Cuba, where I was born. So I use normally three things, oregano, allspice, and cumin. I cannot live without those three ingredients. And always hot pepper. If I don't have anything fresh from the garden, I use cayenne. Or I would be using marash peppers, you know, or maybe urfa beaver, which is a bit sweeter. Uh, but the idea is that you make a simple sofrito, now, because this is, I want to treat the onions here almost as a vegetable. I will not cook them down to a confit consistency, but this is what I do if I want to get more flavor out of my sofrito. I cook things down until you see the oil being exuded from the vegetables. That's when you get the best flavors. But here, I want to treat the onions as a vegetable, so I'm not going to overcook them at all. So I start with the onions. I add the garlic, which is essential in my cooking. I would not brown it a lot because I want that freshness. Then I like to add cherry tomatoes for my sofrito, which is very typical, um, you know, of, of traditional Cuban cooking. Not the big steak tomatoes, not even the uh, plum tomatoes. And I would not cook this a lot. But normally, if I were doing a sofrito like that, I would get this down to a confit kind of consistency. And yesterday, during the challenge, somebody was making a sofrito and I said, cook it down until you begin to see the oil being exuded. In fact, we were doing a mole. We did a mole in two hours, a real mole. And when you're frying the uh, chili paste, and the uh, seasoning in ingredients, basically tomatoes and onions, everything that has been roasted, you have to follow the same rules. You have to wait until everything starts frying again. You know, that paste has to, you know, when you see the oil being ex ex you know, exuded, that's when you stop. All right, so here now is my seasonings, allspice, oregano, my cumin, And the zucchini. Now, I add a little bit of chicken stock, but right now at home, if I were doing this, I would use dachi because I'm in love with dachi. So, you know, maybe not with the bonito, but just with a kombu dashi, but I would be very careful about the kombu because I have a stock from kombu that I brought from Chicago Island. So, um, so I, I would use dashi. And uh, if I want to give a Japanese 
you know, more of a Japanese twist, I would add sake leaves, which are always in my refrigerator. So the miso, the sake leaves would come now. So you get umami. It would be incredible. You want something more tropical Caribbean, a uh, little, or Brazilian, dried, dried shrimp into a powder you added to this. But I was in a very Mediterranean frame of mind when I did this recipe, because I'm working on a Spanish cookbook about my family's, my family's history. So uh, I'm very taken with a Catalan uh, enrichment called picada. Do you know it? Picada. So when they have something like this, that they want to give the texture and flavor, with mortar and pestle, they would take some garlic, some almonds, and parsley, and some salt, and they would grind it, all right? So you can have hazelnuts if you want to. Instead of parsley, I would use the uh, capsicum leaves, which are amazing, and they won't kill you, by the way. So, um, but what I like to do to this picada is to add cacao nibs. So this is my secret ingredient, it comes from this, this is their dry pots, but cacao. So I add cacao to the uh, picada, I grind, I grind, and um, I have something like this that I stir into my vegetables. And this adds, well, this is hot, uh, this adds a lot of backbone. And you know what I like to do also? And it's not overkill, I swear to you, chocolate. Now, this <laughs> is local. This is from uh, Napa. You know, this is Thomas Keller's chocolate uh, made by a Vietnamese chocolatier. So I like to add some, some chocolate. Maricel, if you're incorporating Japanese influences into your dish, what about it makes it fundamentally Latin? Well, the sofrito is fundamentally the, Latin. The sofrito. Absolutely. And the use of cumin, oregano, allspice, mm -hmm. that's totally ours. So everything else mm. that I would add, you know, would give a backbone of flavor. It would mm. intensify flavor, would make it more serious. Mm. You know, I call it backbone, really. Even the chocolate, although it doesn't have umami, but, it, but it's also fermented food. Mm -hmm. So it has this depth that is really unbelievable. So this will cook a little bit. And Maricel, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we're at the end of the time. That's it. <laughs> it's, and then you finish this with um, something beautiful, like these zucchini blossoms. You know, these are not the freshest that I have seen, but uh, that would be it. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> All, right. All right, so something like that. And since this is the end, I will only show you something that is very basic. You know, um, let's say that you have something, you know, like boiled, as simple as boiled uh, vegetables. So this is uh, kabocha squash, not because I'm into Japanese cooking, but because the Latins prefer it, because mm -hmm. it's closer to what they have at home, the calabaza. Uh, purple potatoes. So something like this, essentially, I, you know, you just have the two things. Mix them together. I'm going to do the musa thing. Mm. <laughs> Nobody's going to eat it. Uh, and basically, you end up, you know, you put olive oil. So this is a blend of ingredients. You know, this mm -hmm. has uh, some paprika, some cumin, a little bit of allspice. I told you, these are the, uh, the workhorses of my kitchen. And I like to use some vinegar. You know, it could be balsamic vinegar, because this is an old recipe, I use balsamic. Now I use dark vinegar and Japanese rice vinegar. Maricel, I'm so sorry, but no, I've been- No, this is done. It's done, okay. <laughs> this is done. Here you are. And this is marash, marash pepper from uh, Musa. There you are. Thank you, Maricel. Dinner yeah. is served. Yeah.
Well, clearly, Maricel is a font of wisdom. So if you have more questions for her, please seek her out. She's, she's truly a national treasure. And you need to also, you need to taste the, the Coban peppers. Mm. They're smoked, OK? And um, no. actually, I would finish with a little bit of the Coban peppers. <laughs> Bravo. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, speaking of national treasures, another one is Diane Kochilas, and also a treasure for Greece, of course. Um, she I, is a person I met when I was at Gourmet, and she introduced me to the concept of horta the wild greens that people fan out into the countryside to collect, and it turns out they're incredibly good for you. They've been around for thousands of years, most likely. Um, she has been a, con she's a chef and has been a consultant to many of the top Greek restaurants in this country, and also universities, including um, UMass Amherst, Harvard, Yale. She's a cookbook author. You can find her books in the store here. Um, her latest is My Greek Table. Uh, her previous book, one of my favorites, is Ikaria, Food, Life, and Longevity from the Island Where People Forget to Die. It's also, yeah, it uh, has won an IACP award. It's, she's um, authored more than 16 other books in both English and Greek. And she's a cooking school owner and runs the Glorious Greek Cooking School on Ikaria, which is where she's from. Um, and she's also the host and producer of My Greek Table, which is on PBS, a national cooking travel series. So please welcome Diane Kuchilos. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from the island of Ikaria and from New York City, and we have no sense of time, so I'm forewarning you from now. <laughs> That's to the contingents on that side of the room. I'm only kidding. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the use of vegetables in the Greek kitchen before I start. And I thought I would do something that today that draws a little bit on my restaurant experience as a consulting chef, now at Committee Restaurant in Boston, which is to focus on one, uh, one recipe and different uses for that recipe. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, the use of vegetables in the Greek kitchen. I don't know where the remote is. Oh, here. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think, to my mind, I, I like to think that more than um, any other cuisine in the Mediterranean, Greek cuisine probably boasts the largest array of plant-based main courses. Um, I might have to take that back after seeing uh, Musta yesterday making that amazing Turkish recipe that looked very similar to many of the things that we cook as well. Um, the, the, the array of vegetable dishes in Greece is really mind-boggling, and a lot of those traditions stem from you know, cultural and religious um, aspects of, of life in the country as well. But there's a huge fasting tradition, so for people who follow it for half the year, they're totally going off you know, all meat, all animal products. And that makes people creative. And so over the course of time, an you know, incredible amount of, of plant-based uh, dishes has evolved. And we're also, of course, blessed to live in a place where plants taste incredibly good. Um, all, all produce is just an amazing taste experience in Greece. And I think from my own personal experience, one of the things that maybe set me on my own course as a cook was eating a tomato for the first time in 1972 in my aunt's garden. Um, I was a kid who grew up in New York City on orange tomatoes in plastic bins, and they had absolutely no flavor and the texture of baseballs. So, the, you know, this was a sensory experience that really opened my eyes at the age of 12 and kind of made me realize that there was this, what real food is and what real food tastes like and what, what it truly means to respect the, the integrity of food and, and cook within seasons. So, just in, in terms of the way vegetables are used in the Greek kitchen, there are a lot of different... Um, a lot of different um, conduits for, for using vegetables and a lot of different um, places on the table. For example, the meze, the whole meze tradition, which are the small shared plates. You find all sorts of amazing um, vegetable recipes in this part of Greek dining. 
um, things like fritters that are made with vegetables, all the spreads, um, yogurt-based dishes that, you know, like tzatziki, for example, but made with all sorts of vegetables, not necessarily just cucumbers. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm like really not good with this stuff. It, this is not, oh, it is moving, okay. <laughs> Um, fritters are a whole other um, area of the cuisine that are really interesting. And if you think a little bit about life in the Mediterranean before tourism made everybody a lot more affluent, people made, made you know, sort of had, had to um, eat on very little. They had, they had their gardens, they had what was forageable, um, they had what was in season. Meat was not a huge part of the diet for the most part, except in shepherding communities, because it was expensive. So it was safe for special occasions. But when you're feeding a family of six or 10 people every day, you've got to stretch the larder as much as you can. So fritters are one, were one way of doing that. And you still find this incredible array of vegetable, you know, plant-based fritters all over Greece. Um, beans, greens, um, zucchini, pumpkin, all of that stuff gets mixed and either fried or baked. Falafel could, I guess, could be seen as part of that tradition as well, although that's, it's not exactly Greek, it's more Middle Eastern. Um, the savory pie traditions, I think Greece is unique in that respect. The amount of, of pies, are, I mean, we all know spanakopita, maybe we know tiropita, the cheese pie, but the greens pies and the vegetable pies, and in, in really poor rural communities, you even find things like lentil pies, you know, just anything to make a substantial meal out of almost nothing. And this is really beautiful food. And, the, the people who make the pies and understand how to work with phyllo, homemade phyllo dough, um, they were special people in small rural communities. Um, people who, you know, women would turn to the, 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 the woman in the village who knew how to make the perfect rim. And on special occasions, you still see that in Greek villages, especially on, you know, at weddings or, you know, engagements. Women gather together and make just massive quantities of pies, both sheet pies and individual pieces, handheld pies. So that's a really you know, big part of our tradition. These are just some of the, some examples of the, the two on top are from my island, from Ikaria. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the ingredients that go into the vegetable pies because they change with every season and sometimes there are upwards of 20 different greens, herbs and vegetables that go into one filling. Um, flatbreads, again, kind of within that, that main category of, of pies, whether they're individual, handheld, open-faced, or closed. Um, greens, I mean, Italians own tomatoes, Greeks own greens. <laughs> we call them horta, and it's, it's a huge part of how we eat and live um, from October to May. Uh, we're out foraging. This is still a living tradition. I had a great experience in my own cooking school a few years ago. I, I worked with a local friend of mine who is one, one person on the island who knows the flora inside out. And I asked her to come and kind of show us, it was Easter time, it was a spring class, so the island was really green. And she was complaining the whole time that there, you know, it didn't rain that year, there was nothing out there, and I'm watching the clock, so I better start cooking. Um, she collected up something like 35 different greens within a 100-foot radius of my front door. So, the floor is really rich, and all of this stuff is edible, and there's a therapeutic value to a lot of this food as well. Um, I don't, why don't I just let this go forward, and I'll start cooking. Um, if that's okay, if you can do that automatically. And we can, if you have any questions at the end, the, the slides are pretty self-explanatory. So I am doing a dish that's based on greens today, which is um, hortorizo or spanakorizo. It's typically made with uh, spinach, or greens, horta, the word for greens, and rice. We saw something, something similar yesterday. Um, I think Musta made a dish like that with greens, and I don't think it was rice, it was a different grain. But I, this is, it's, this, it's the basic recipe for spanakopita, except there are different um, variations of that. So if you're using rice with it, it turns into a spanakorizo or a hortorizo. If you're um, putting it in a food processor, which I hope to have time to do with a little bit of yogurt and some feta cheese, it becomes a variation of tzatziki. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I, I always think in, when I'm in a restaurant kitchen, you have to make prep as easy as possible. Restaurant kitchens tend to be tight, tight quarters. And 
this is something that I'm, you know, we're always talking about. We're always thinking about how to, how to make the best use out of, you know, say one or two dishes and how to stretch them even on a menu. So if you can get two or three things out of one basic preparation, I think that's a really important lesson. Um, like everything that we've seen here, almost everything that we've seen in the last two, two days uh, here at Copia, everything starts with, all good things start with olive oil, onions, and garlic. <laughs> And this is no different. And copious amounts of olive oil. I think Greeks have the, uh, I think that we win the award for olive oil consumption. I think it's something like 22 liters a year per person. It's gone down a little bit since the crisis, but not so much to make a real dent in consumption. So I start with my onions, and I just want to cook those until they're soft. We don't want much color on that. Um, a little bit of garlic goes in here as well. And I'm going to add my, I'm, I'm doing this with brown rice today. I would typically do this either with brown or white rice if I were doing it either in the restaurant or at home. And this is also a dish that pairs beautifully. It, it stands on its own as a main course, but it's also a wonderful um, uh, base for, for animal or fish protein. So we would serve this sometimes with a piece of salmon or a piece of fish or maybe some grilled shrimp or even a, you know, a piece of chicken. The rice goes in here next. Now, typically I would do this with raw greens, but I needed to push it a little bit time-wise, so I have uh, my greens are already cooked here. And everything you see out on this beautiful display um, is actually in this mixture of greens here. So the idea is that you want to use things that are in season. Um, spinach and sweet greens. If you're using greens, they have to be sweet. So you start with everything in the onion family. Onion, uh, you could use shallot, leek, scallion, spring onion, all of that could go in here. If you're using greens, you want to use things like spinach, uh, Swiss chard, uh, sweet sorrel, sweet dandelion, not bitter dandelion, uh, lamb's quarters, um, almost anything you can think of that has a mild sweet flavor. I like to get a little color in my, mix, in my fillings. This goes for the pies as well as for the rice, uh, the rice dishes. So things like um, winter squashes or carrots, depending on the season, summer squashes, could also go into this mix. And then all manner of herbs. And I think that's also something that distinguishes Greek, the palette of Greek flavors, maybe from other foods within the Mediterranean. Ours is more of a... a, a um, an herb-based palette, not so much a spice-based palette. So you find things like uh, the profuse use of dill and fresh mint and oregano. All of those things are, are what give Greek food um, its, its flavor profile. So I'm adding my cooked greens to this. And again, this is a combination of pretty much everything you see um, out here. Thank you. I'm adding a little bit of vegetable stock. And a little bit of, I'll add a little bit of water to this. Thank you. And I'm gonna just let that cook down. A little bit of uh, white wine goes in here as well. I should have added that a bit earlier. Uh, some salt. And a little bit of pepper. And I will let that actually cook um, and get on with my next recipe because the color in this, in the new one, is much brighter. And as we say in Greece, you eat with your eyes before you eat with your mouth. So, you know, the way food looks is very important. Um, I want to move on to um, kind of a variation of this as this cooks down. And that is taking the same filling and putting it in a food processor and making a kind of tzatziki with it. Again, the idea is to just show you how flexible this cuisine is. And I think that is. And that's really true of the entire Mediterranean. This is really forgiving food. If you don't have one herb, you can typically substitute it with something else. It's not going to make a huge difference. And that's something important to keep in mind when you're cooking. Um, I have my filling here a little bit. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. 
What's that? Okay. So I'm just going to get this in here. Now, tzatziki is the Greek, the Greek yogurt, uh, cucumber, garlic, and dill dip that you find in pretty much every Greek restaurant in the world. And this is, it's something that um, most people don't realize um, you, can, you, you can make with almost any vegetable. So you find beet tzatziki in the Greek kitchen. You find um, pumpkin tzatziki, roasted pumpkin tzatziki, um, greens, spinach. Um, there was a picture earlier, I don't know if you saw that, of um, purslane tzatziki. So it's something that, it's extremely versatile. And let me just, uh, I forgot to add more garlic to this. A little bit of olive oil. Some cayenne pepper. And just a little bit of lemon zest. spatula here? Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to get this cleaned off here. One second. Diane, while you're yeah. doing that, can I ask you for your advice on phyllo? What is on your phyllo? What's your favorite brand? What should we look for here in the U.S.? Uh, my favorite, I'm sorry? Your favorite brand here in the U.S. or one that you would suggest? My favorite brand, am I allowed to say that without getting in trouble? <laughs> I don't know, is she? <laughs> or maybe one of the ones that you like uh, that we can look for. Well, I would have to name my, my, my sponsor's brand, which mm -hmm. is Phyllo Factory, but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> Okay, this is almost ready. This is looking really good. Um, and I have some, I wanted to serve this with a little bit of falafel just to show you, again, it's just a variation on a theme. And you can also serve this um, individually as a dip. So one second, sorry, I've got a lot, a lot going on up here. I got a little ambitious today. I do think it is, it's really important um, when you're thinking about, you know, and this, this is the kind of food that's, that could either go uh, fast casual or high end, depending on presentation and various other things. But I do think it's important to keep flexibility in mind. And I, have so, I had some chopped tomatoes back here. Did you take those? Oh. <laughs> and my, um, my cayenne. Go. Thank you. Okay, this can go. This is done, and I have, I don't know if I have time to do the last one, but I wanted to show you um, some different interpretations of this as well. So I've actually prepped some dishes. Um, one of them is an all-time Greek classic, which is the same filling as a, as a pita in phyllo. And one of them is what I think is a genius recipe because it's so simple and it actually came to me at, totally out of necessity. Um, I had leftover uh, spanakopita filling at home one day, and my son came home from school, he was starving, he was about 15 or 16 at the time, and I don't know if any of you have ever raised a boy, but at that age they eat incredible quantities of food. And I did not have um, any pita left, but I had filling, and I 
I had bread, and I thought, all right, well, what if I made you a spanakopita grilled cheese? Mm -hmm. And I did, and it actually has turned out to be one of the best sellers on the menu at committee. Uh, we serve it at brunch with a little bit of uh, a side of tomato soup. And it's, it's just one of those dishes that somehow really hit a chord. So that's already pre-prepped um, here as well. And I've got my spinach rice almost done here. I, I hate to break it to you, but we are at the time. What's that? <laughs> we're, we're finished. We're out okay, of time. Let me, let me serve this then. Mm -hmm. And if you all have questions for Diane, please catch up with her at the break. It'd be great. I might not be able to yeah. serve the one that's been cooking. But that's, yeah. it's, it, the rice is not really cooked. It does look absolutely delicious. And, um, and thank you so much, Diane. Wait, let me just serve this. Wait, wait, wait. You can't, wait, one second, one second, one second. You've got to give a homage to, to Ikaria. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's time to go, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and our, our third chef and font of wisdom is Fetla Work Teferi. And she's the chef and owner at Cafe Colucci in Oakland. And um, right before uh, right before we came on today, she was telling me that she was a banker, really. Um, that's her profession. And then uh, several years ago, two of her friends were opening this Italian restaurant in Oakland and asked her for her help. She was kind of interested. And so she started doing just a little cooking at the cafe. And then, you know, three years later, she's completely taken over. <laughs> she's cooking all the food. And it is an Ethiopian restaurant. And she she has no professional training. She learned from her mother. It was just in her. She, she knew this food. Um, and now at Cafe Colucci, uh, the spice blends all come from her own organic spice company, Brundo International, which is in the central Ethiopian town of Mojdo, Modjo. Pardon me. And she services from all local farmers. And it's almost, almost all the employees are female there. And um, it's, it's a great driver of local economy. And um, she also helps pay for the uniforms and the lunch program at a nearby school, which the employees' kids attend. Um, and she came to the US when the revolution in Ethiopia started uh, and uh, to the Midwest and then moved to California later. So um, I'm really looking forward, as I'm sure you all are, to understanding a bit more about Ethiopian food and how that can help us also move forward in the best old-fashioned way. Thank you. Wow. Um, I am humbled. <laughs> um, and... Um, I have devoted most of my life to the discovery, the preservation, and the just total appreciation of Ethiopian food. Basically, when I first started, I did not understand the concept um, on how women um, can blend spices for days on end to create a flavor. It takes them almost two weeks to make a chili pepper blend that's um, called barbare, and uh, about 14 spices. And um, I was in awe and said, like, this is really um, serious um, talent that goes into making food. Um, so spice blending happens in, during harvest time, and women with knowledge um, would give recipes to their daughter and different regions will have maybe slightly different um, spices, but the primary um, um, lesson that I got was spices make vegetables, legumes, grains, everything taste amazing. If the spices are prepared early on, and all you got to do is just 
make the lentil sauce and add a couple of the different spices, blends, and uh, you have a dish um, that is just amazing, you know, delicious. Um, in Ethiopia, uh, just like my Greek counterpart, um, there are over 180 days of vegan um, and no meat, no dairy diets due to religious and cultural um, uh, differences. Um, and also another thing that really developed uh, that, was, that I was curious about is the other population um, and the Christian population do share this vegan food together for festivities uh, because the, the meats are the ones that have religious um, restrictions. So the vegetables is a communal thing. So most people come together to enjoy vegetables and grains and um, legumes. So I want to focus on legumes primarily because a lot of the, um, the Ethiopian food uh, focuses on lentils, chickpeas, baba, and all of that. But what I um, kind of found very as I go back to Ethiopia every time and learn more is, I mean, they can make souffle from uh, fava flour. I mean, I was like, I've been trying, I still haven't been able to see, to get it like flat like they do it, but um, maybe add, they add a little bit of fenugreek here and there, a little lentil flour, and then there is a flour that can bring that um, to make a souffle. So a lot of the salads, like the lentil um, salad that's mixed with the with the uh, mustard um, in itself called azifa. We serve it at the restaurant. Um, it is very popular, the butija, which is a chickpea flower salad. That's also um, very, very popular. Um, so um, the other cornerstone of Ethiopian cuisine is um, our pulses, as they're called, uh, flaxseed, Niger seed, and uh, to a lower, lower extent, sesame seed, but um, and safflower. So with the, with um, the the flax seed, you can make a sauce with flax seed with the berbere, for example. And it would just be like flax seed dip with berbere. It could taste. It just tastes very good. Um, with the um, the Niger seed, I remember when uh, when I was growing up, they would like roast it a little bit, and then crush it and boil it and the oil would just go right on top and they would scoop the oil up and just saute stuff. Um, and they were just like, okay, magic. <laughs> so those kind of st stuff that I want to go back, I do, I continue to go back to, to explore more, to learn more, so I can explain to, 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 to people like you what I, what I have discovered there and it's create curiosity and to, um, this is a very sheltered, uh, nation and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just starting to connect to the outside world, uh, especially in culin culinary, culinary, right? <laughs> culinary or culinary, I would, we were debating, but um, <laughs> to culinary art um, um, like this. So um, I'm hoping this would um, have um, some of you interested in exploring further. And today I will be cooking a couple of things. I think the color greens and um, um, and uh, fava bean breakfast item. Um, and uh, later on, I think I'll be doing another session with the spices. So, um, so the colored greens, um, so one thing that's a little different from uh, th that we, we do with Ethiopian cuisine is, is uh, the onions, not to cook them in, o in oil, but to just let them steam and sweat and so they can kind of release flavor. Um, so, so it has to be in low heat and um, I would need a cup of water. I can get it. And a top. So 
So the idea is to have it. I would need a lid to do it, but so we can add a little water to keep to create the same effect. I will attempt to do a second dish over here. Is that possible? <laughs> so over here we we start with oil. This is for the fava bean breakfast, and this is for the collard greens. Okay, so diced tomatoes, again, shallots um, and onions are primary in all of the cookings that we do. Um, yes? This one is full. It's called full, F-O-U-L-E. And it's also spelled differently, different regions and different areas of Africa. Um, and this is collard greens or gomen. In Ethiopia, we call it gomen. You, you can do have turnips and all different kinds of greens um, that you can cook this the same basic way. So the fava beans are uh, breakfast items because uh, it's believed they give energy in the morning, um, and they're eating e eaten with uh, with uh, either pita bread or Ethiopian bread or. We'll get into the Ethiopian bread part as well. Um, so, so we put a little garlic. Hmm? It's not me. <laughs> okay, so. Uh-oh. A, a major resource for for visiting um, chefs to Oakland too, where you're based. Uh, you cooked with Marcus Samuelson not too long ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did. Yeah, from from what I've read, he was um, he he felt that you had quite a lot to show him about traditional ways. Yeah, he, yeah. He he grew up in Sweden, so yeah. he needed to kind of. Uh, go back. <laughs> okay, I think the berbere is not here. So the, this is the, the pepper, the berbere, um, that would go into this to give it that, the flavor that... Um, goodness. My stoves are not this hot. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And also, so the berbere uh, would, would give a little me, bit of flavor here. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want it to be sp too spicy, um, uh, you can lower the heat level. Uh, so you kind of mash the fava beans so you can, it's softer when you chew them. Uh, I think I can't do both at the same time. Okay, so. Can you, yeah, it's too hard. Yeah. For this uh, particular uh, situation, they're canned. But what we do is we, we soak them overnight um, uh, and then um, kind of cook them a little bit. And when we're ready to cook the breakfast, we just scoop mm -hmm. from what we cooked already. So we kind of expedite it that way. Mm -hmm. But 
And yeah. is there ever a situation where you would use a fresh fava bean, or is it always a dried one? Um, fresh? Oh, yeah, the fresh fava beans, um, no. No. What the fresh fava beans are eaten as snacks and stuff during mm -hmm. harvest, mm -hmm. uh, but um, they don't do well when you cook them like, um, like I'm cooking yeah. them now. So. And of all the spices that you're bringing in for your restaurant, mm -hmm. um, are you seeing the potential, which are you seeing has the most potential for a broader audience? I that you're that, seeing sort of taking off more? I think the Barbera is going to be the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a primary spice. It's going to be um, the lead spice. It's the, uh, the most uh, versatile. It could be used in barbecues. It could be used in different um, uh, ways. So um, I think the Barbera would be number one. And then the Shuro blends. And also we have these mm -hmm. blends of legumes that are like ready to cook type of plants. Mm -hmm. So those um, kind of, um, <laughs> so this is, uh, this is for the collard greens. So again, tomatoes, a little bit of oil, a little bit of garlic. So the two things that we, the two spices that we put on these, in these two, uh, dishes, like for the collard greens, we will put like, it's called nigella, nigella seed, I think scientific name, but it's azmud in Amharic, or sometimes called black cumin. So a little bit of salt here, and the collard greens are already prepared over here. And do you have um, flexibility with the greens here too? Uh, could you use another green in place of the collards or? Uh, the colors are readily available here mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S., but turnip and beet greens, all of those mm -hmm. would work. So on this one, we will add, if I can find it, yes, um, cumin. Regular cumin is uh, used because it's also a North African mm -hmm. dish and... Uh, so the spices are similar. So, um, I, I still have time. Yes, you do. <laughs> you are not running out of time. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the, what I want to introduce is, is this bread. Okay, so it's, a, it's, an, uh, it's unusual, it's unique to Ethiopia, it's called uh, injera. Injera is what you need to eat this and this. You have to cut a piece and grab it with the injera and so forth. Um, uh, so, to talk a bit a bit about the injera, it is uh, it's teff, and if some of you have heard of teff, um, um, it is um, kind of gaining popularity in the last 10 years or so, but Ethiopians have been eating it since the days of the pharaohs. They found some grains in his tomb, so um, it's a, a very ancient, ancient grain. It's very difficult to harvest, to grow, but 100 million of Ethiopians, they harvest and eat teff every day, three times a day. So mm. <laughs> um, here, teff in Jara, I cut it in small pieces. This is the American way to present it. In Ethiopia, it's flat. It comes into you flat and so forth. But um, the teff uh, is, the baking of teff is interesting because it, um, uh, you just get the flour, you take the grain, clean it, make it into a flour, and um, put water, ferment it, over a clay griddle, bake it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Nothing. No salt, no eggs, no butter, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Mm. So 
um, it's always with the old the dishes, it's always presented, um, even if you don't need it. Like you can eat this with a fork, the collard greens, but um, you would, in Ethiopia, you do use the injera with it. It also, you, it comes in, teff has different colors. It's not like it's always dark, but the dark teff is available in the US. Um, it's, uh, with teff right now, it's being um, harvested in different nations from Spain to Australia to the US um, as uh, people are discovering this ancient mm -hmm. grain, which makes it really nice because it's, it's a good baking bread. It's, you can make cakes with it, cookies. Uh, even in Ethiopia, they're developing uh, modern food with it. Mm -hmm. So it, it dries really well. This is the, use, the way we used to have it. In, when, I, when I came to this country, we, you get a whole bag full of this. So you just can't toss it in a boiling shuro or something. It softens up and becomes injera. And then you can use fork to eat it, to eat that with it. Um, so uh, in... With the, with the different colors of teff, like the richer you are, you, you, you eat the, the ivory color um, teff. Um, but now, due to knowledge about how um, the grains uh, are very nutritious, the darker they are, so now mm -hmm. people are eating uh, both kinds. So if you go to a wedding ceremony and stuff, you have different color of teff mm -hmm. That you can select from. Does the white teff have the the outer hull removed? Is that what makes it white? Does no, it have it is, anything stripped it, away, or it is the, just the, the seed? Is, the yeah. seed there are white, and then there is a mixture of white, and there is red, and then there is dark brown. Okay. So, so it's just, just the just variety. The seed, yeah. yeah, in the region it grows in uh, the, the high plateaus. They they have ivory teff. Mm. Um, so. Uh, and also, you can make injera with barley and other things as well, but the preferred way is, is, is the teff. Because as you eat it, because you have rich sauces here, and the teff, the injera is not, is not uh, caloric or... So it's, it makes it easy to just um, consume as much well, stuff thank that you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for okay. showing us these specialties. Thank you. Thank you. How did I do? <laughs> Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you to all of our presenters for this session. Um, and we are now going to talk about uh, plant-forward cooking for meat lovers. Um, when I was talking with our presenter about this, the, his contribution to this conference, he was telling me that's something that he's been really working on a lot. And as came up uh, yesterday during one of the sessions, there's really a need to um, uh, to preach to the not con yet converted, right? And and to um, to transform uh, meat lovers into plant lovers. So Suvir Saran, who is a chef in New Delhi, India, who's also working on restaurants in London right now, um, who has uh, worked in New York, was the first Michelin-starred Indian chef um, in the U.S has been very involved with the, um, the CIA for years as the chairman of our Asian Culinary Studies, for example, um, cookbook author, um, including of Indian home cooking and American masala, um, has been really thinking about how to uh, incorporate a lot more plants in uh, meat-centric, in traditionally meat-centric dishes, and I'm very happy that he will be sharing this with us this morning. Suvir Saran. Thank you. Good morning. The first dish I have is jackfruit, which um, in India, the person who plants the tree, they say, is going to be killed by the jackfruit plant, uh, the tree, because the fruit falls on their head and they say they die. So nobody in India wants to plant it, but they all want to eat jackfruit. <laughs> My uh, our ancestral home in Delhi that I grew up in is now being broken down and built into an apartment building. And my mother has made sure that the jackfruit tree, the entire backside of our home is being built around it so that the tree survives the change in the home structure. So that's how sacred jackfruit is. I grew up vegetarian, and I uh, cheated and became a meat eater, and I have come back to mostly being a vegetarian again. I uh, ate, ate meat for around 10 years, and every time I ate it the next morning, I was sick, dull, tired, and I realized my body wasn't accepting it. But um, Indian food, Indian sensibilities around all the vegetables that everybody is claiming are theirs, um, we've also had them forever. 
and we uh, cook a gazillion things with them because we also had spices and aromatics and herbs and a lot of life in us. So we cooked everything that life could afford us and we made them work together without much um, expense but at some time and thoughtfulness. So jackfruit became a substitute for meat, not because we were wanting a substitute, but in most homes in India, this is what they want instead of meat. And there'll be one or two kids who are the spoiled brats who want chicken because chicken was expensive once in India, so they all want what's the expensive thing, not the tastier thing. But people who've eaten jackfruit will find the chicken curry very boring. But if um, you serve them jackfruit uh, made correctly, they'll say, it's so meaty, this chicken is so moist. So they, <laughs> they'll think that chicken is actually better than a real chicken curry. So what we've done is we've fried canned jackfruit here, and we're going to add um, some onions that have been, where are the brown, brown onions in these? No, oh, we haven't sorted here. Um, so we pretended that we've taken some oil in which we put garlic and ginger. And garlic in, in, in North Indian homes, what we did in the garlic here, which you didn't see, we took the three or four garlic cloves and I grind them with cumin uh, seeds. And what it does is it, does, it takes away that bitterness that you can get if garlic isn't handled correctly. And it perfumes the dish in a very wonderful way. So again, our, what we are looking for in Indian plant-based cooking is layering of flavor that doesn't make you miss meat. What you're getting in a meal that's cooked correctly with these steps of adding flavors in layers is a whole discovery on your palate of new things hitting your brain at different times of eating. First, the whole spices that we put in oil, which we'll be putting in the next dish, they perfume the dish with what we call khada masala, which means standing flavor. Maricel kept saying backbone, backbone, backbone. That's what we call the backbone of our cooking, where those first ingredients that we fry in oil perfume the dish with a long-lasting flavor that will haunt you and even your skin if you've eaten too much of it for a couple of days <laughs> with the essential oils and the, the, the spices coming out. So that's the first big, bold flavor. And then we add to that the powdered spices, which we'll put here. We're putting some... Um, Cumin powder, we'll put some chili powder from Maricel we borrowed from the Americas, some turmeric, some coriander powder, and a little garam masala. And we'll pretend we've cooked them a few minutes. In a perfect world, we will add a little water to just make sure that the spices don't um, burn down. Now we'll add tomatoes. So I am sorry, I'm a little messy. I, because of my enjoyment of foie gras and uh, fugu sperm and all kinds of sinful meat eating, I had a stroke last March and I am finally getting myself together and living a more full life. But I can't handle too much weight with my arms, but I cook every day. Um, I've realized that my numbers for my, my, all my medical numbers are so much better when I eat plants. And the doctor, they, they find me a poster child for cardiovascular health and can't understand why the stroke happened. But when I do eat meat, I used to be a glutton. I would eat 50 oysters in one evening. <laughs> and then limp for the next week. So, because of gout. <laughs> so, gout, the emperor's disease. Um, I'm adding some tomato paste to make these uh, dead tomatoes come alive with flavor. And there are two things you can do at this point. We can A, add yogurt. In, uh, in northern India, they use yogurt to make sauces a little uh, sour and uh, lighter. I don't know why we think by adding uh, yogurt things become lighter, but it's in our head or it's for real. We, it, they do. They, they get digested much more easily. So you'll add two or three uh, tablespoons of yogurt and it makes the sauce a brighter orange. And at that point, you'll add the uh, deep fried uh, jackfruit. You can add some uh, little green chilies. Again, an American ingredient, some cilantro. And then depending on which part of India you are, you can either add a little water to this or leave it just coating it uh, like a dry uh, sauce that coats rather than runs in a a brothy way, and it's done. And when you eat it, it's moist, it's uh, delicate, it's chewy, but uh, has a lot of give. It's, it's a wonderful recipe. And all Indian homes have a version of it where they'll put 
uh, edit out one spice or add another. But the basics of uh, cooking a northern Indian curry are we, uh, sauce, which doesn't mean actually curry as in curry powder, cumin, coriander, cloves, uh, fennel, black peppercorn, cardamom, cinnamon. These are the, this is the basic stock of spices. And then depending on which region you are in, in southern India they would have put uh, sesame seeds, they would have added some coconut in the sauce to add a little creaminess and also a toasty nutty flavor. If you were in Maharashtra, they would have put maybe uh, more garlic, robust garlic, some more chilies, a lot of red Somehow, when the Portuguese brought the chilies from the Americas, the western coast of India loved the heat of the food. Our food wasn't hot. We, we had perfectly balanced flavors in our cooking, but then when the chilies came, we forgot that food was meant to be balanced. We started cooking with a lot of um, heat. A little lemon juice, I would have tasted it, but this is TV cooking, not real cooking. <laughs> you taste the acid. So we always say the spices, acid and salt have to come together and we'll put it in a more elegant way. Um, we, before we go to the next recipe, spices, lemon, salt. It's a balancing act in cooking. You need acidity to make things become bright and alive. The uh, salt wakes up all the spices you've added into the food. All those layers of spices that you add in a dish are sleeping till the right amount of salt hits the pan. So a, a pinch of salt can either make a dish brilliant or a pinch too little and it's boring. So after all that effort of gathering spices and putting them into a pan, if you don't salt enough, the food is dead. So if you're cooking fresh vegetables, fresh produce with a little meat, salt should not be your worry, as long as it's not processed food that you're putting into the pan. Let your taste buds be the guiding factor that brings food to your table. The food will be very brilliantly flavorful. This dish, the cornbread that we are showing you, is a recipe that my partner who grew up in West Virginia, his mother, uh, Grandma Hayes, you made for me my first time when I went to West Virginia, and she said, well, honey, he ain't no black, he's Indian. So she, she didn't know what an Indian man looked like, and it was a revelation to her that I didn't look like what she thought I should. And Grandma said, and then she touched my skin, oh, his skin is soft. And I said, okay. And, and my hair, the hair is like silk. I said, I was like, I was like corn on the cob, we studied by her. But Grandma then said to me, oh, honey, I will make you some cornbread, and it's the best thing I know how to make. And I know you're a chef in New York City. This cornbread, every man that ate it wanted to marry me. And she, and she, and she was married five times. And, she was, <laughs> and all of them fell in love with this recipe. And I saw her making it, and I was appalled by the ingredients that were going into the dish. But when I closed my eyes and ate it, it was delicious. So I uh, spent a week crying over it. How would I make it better? So I realized she was using canned corn, cream corn that came in a can. She was using sour cream. She was using Jiffy cornbread mix and uh, uh, egg and uh, onions, which at least one fresh thing went into the recipe. And um, I think that was it. And sugar, two tablespoons of sugar. So I took her recipe. I substituted canned corn for fresh corn that we roast on the fire. That for, for one bag of Jiffy mix, if you must use it, or you can make your own version with for uh, Three cups of flour, one cup, three cups of cornmeal, one cup of flour, and then I, I use almost a cup and a half of yogurt, a cup and a half of cilantro, green chilies, uh, red onions, yogurt, and some parmigiano reggiano. And this, people win. I get, keep getting updates from people who make these at their county fairs and go to different cornbread cookouts, and this recipe always wins. And <laughs> Gail Green, who was the food critic of New York Magazine, Said to, she said, this is, she used to get her, a, um, she used to get an ice cream cake, Carvel's ice cream cake for her birthday every year. It's been replaced 14 years ago by this cake. So now the birthday cake is this cornbread, grandma's cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> this cornbread will teach people how to enjoy texture and food. When grandma ate it, she said to me, oh, honey, I was worried that you were putting fresh corn. I said, why grandma? She said, oh, it gives heartburn, heartburn. Said, so anything that's fresh for them is heartburn, onions, heartburn. I said, but you put onions in that grandma. Oh, honey, sometimes you need to be sinful. So, <laughs> so, but this cornbread is delicious. Uh, it's an easy recipe. It does make meat eaters at a table who are afraid of trying vegetables quite ready to try vegetables. When they eat a cornbread that's so delicious and so yummy, and unlike any other cornbread, they trust you. And at that point, you can do anything with them. You can either make them better people or ruin their lives. 
So they really, <laughs> they trust you. But that uh, is a delicious recipe to know. But India came in just adding fresh vegetables into it. I couldn't understand sour cream, cream corn, we replaced it. Uh, the next recipe is a Pakistani Indian recipe, which is a beef recipe. And we made it, thank you Anne, she made it a little more plant forward even than it was. And um, it's always good to grow in life. Um, India being mostly vegetarian, Hindu, which we somehow, when the uh, Abrahamic religions came to India, Indians started creating myths and legends to match with theirs. Our country, well, we didn't have any dietary code or restrictions to worry about, but somehow cattle, beef became the uh, one animal that we had to preserve. So India doesn't eat beef too much, but the Muslims eat beef. So we, this recipe comes from the Muslim neighborhoods of India where they put, they enjoy beef. And for breakfast, sometimes they'll make a, a halim or even for dinner, late dinners. And it's eaten like a chili. And that's with this cornbread is a wonderful way for people to start trusting you and opening their palates for your uh, change, being the force of change in their lives. I've added some black peppercorn, cumin seeds, cinnamon, cardamom and cloves, and some coriander. This is our backbone of the food that we were talking about. But we call this backbone something that you can almost forget. You don't need to worry about it. You put it in the dish, but it should not be the thing that you taste first. And that's why we call it the backbone. That it's, you can forget about it, it will be there. Don't worry. It's all the other things that you add that you have to be careful about. Are you burning them? Are you uh, uh, using them correctly in the right amount? Coriander powder uh, is citrusy, cumin powder, is um, a little um, must, uh, very earthy. One, uh, it's almost like the French subways where you have everybody in the summer just off a little uh, with the sweat. That's the <laughs> odor that cumin has. It's must, musty. And the one lifts the other. One teaspoon of cumin has to be uh, countered by two tablespoons of uh, coriander. And that's the balancing act and spicing there. Cayenne pepper, if you add heat, you have to add some kind of caramelized onions or uh, sugars into the dish to make the uh, heat be countered by that. We took onions, ginger, green chilies that we, uh, and garlic that we blended into a puree. We cooked it down into this sauce where these spices already were. And we'll now add them back. So this pan is not big enough. So we would, we would cook it at least this brown, if not a little browner. The, the more you cook, the uh, sweeter the caramelization tastes as a counter to any heat you are adding in the dish. And so uh, we'll pretend this was perfectly done. We've taken mushrooms and reduced them, to the, take, <laughs> dried them out as far as we could, add them into the onions. And this was Anne's uh, genius suggestion, and I, it worked. And it's, the Pakistanis, the Indians will be very proud. Because for us, we sleep happier knowing that we ate vegetables. Because we are all talking about the movements the next morning. And, <laughs> and I, I remember the Greeks do the same thing. And so they, each vegetable will make the form of it different. So they sit at the table, what, what, oh, ridiculous. But that's how much we love our vegetables. Because what goes in must come out. And it must come out with ease. So now we're adding some uh, oats to it. And we'll mix them together, make a porridge, add a little water, and let it simmer. And the oats will cook in the steam. And that haleem with the, uh, the beef, I guess, was put in the onions. <laughs> uh, the ground beef was in the onions. And we've, people have it with toast. People have it with pita bread. People have it with naan, which is the traditional way of doing it. But in modern Delhi, I was horrified that pita bread has taken over. It's not, it's been replaced by, naan has been replaced by pita bread. Pita chips, the American corporations in big bags are selling jumbo-sized pita chips for the Indian market. And uh, those pita chips can be dipped into halim. Um, I serve it as a dip. I serve it as a chili with the cornbread. I serve it as a bowl full of sinful uh, indulgence, where you can just put chopped onions, some cilantro, some mint leaves, uh, cucumber, tomatoes as a topping with lime juice. It's amazing. So what you do with it is as uh, bold or as uh, stayed as you want it to be. But the idea is that you're getting oats. Who would have thought in India they were using, we call it dalia, the steel-cut oats. 
They use this to, again, lighten the uh, amount of beef you're using for two reasons, health, but also cost. It was, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, Diane said, in Greek homes, it was also the money. India was the richest nation in the 1700s. The British made it the poorest nation when they left in, 18, in 1947. But the, what stood with us was our principles of cooking that we are slowly now losing. But those principles were of using lots of greens, lots of vegetables, lots of legumes, lentils, grains, and very little meat. Meat was that little indulgence once in a while that you shared with uh, loved ones, maybe once a week, and no more than a half an ounce or one ounce per person. That was as much meat as we would eat. But today people have forgotten that meat was meant to be eaten that way. And India is slowly becoming the most diabetic, diabetes ridden, cardiovascular disease ridden, and metabolic syndrome ridden country in the world, replacing America very soon. So uh, it's uh, a sadness to see a culture that knew vegetables and meat so beautifully, forget it. But I hope the rest of the world will keep going back to it. And this cornbread, grandma married five men with it. You can make many people very happy by serving it to them and bring more f fun vegetables and uh, grains to their diet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Subir. And to your health, please keep eating vegetables. Uh, Subir will be back during one of the, the second set of breakouts in this room. Um, I want to take a second, as we are uh, finishing our general sessions, to thank our sponsors who have made this conference possible. We're not parting ways yet. You have series of breakouts, but I think it's important as we're all gathering that we take a minute to recognize um, the people who really allow us to come here together. Um, the, I want to just show you a couple of slides um, quickly from the, uh, this is the Masters of Professional Food Study, of Professional Studies in a Food Business School, which is a, uh, some online master's degrees um, offered by the CIA um, with three, three, 27 online credits and three res residencies credits, you're uh, doing two residencies here in um, the Napa Valley, and you're doing one in um, uh, Hyde Park as part of the Menus of Change conference. Um, so those are programs um, that are starting in the fall. They're accepting uh, applications right now for the second set of um, the, the second class of the of, Food Business School Masters starting in the fall. There are brochures outside on the, uh, at the hospitality desk for the programs of, of the Food Business School and the Master of Professional Studies. Um, and then the uh, other one are the two masters that we are offering in Barcelona. There are also brochures outside on the hospitality desk. Um, one, this uh, master's here is in English. It is for people with a scientific background. So if you're a nutritionist, if you are a, um, a doctor, um, if you are uh, doing anything with public health, if you have that kind of scientific background, this is a master's that um, uh, teaches you further nutrition information and scientific information based on the Mediterranean diet and also with hands-on cooking lessons, sociology, uh, history, uh, to really give you an over, um, a well-rounded um, Mediterranean diet background to then communicate to patients, for example, and not just tell them they should eat better and do better for their diet, but how to do it. Um, and then this master's here is in Spanish. Um, this one targets um, uh, culinary professionals, communication professional, tourism professionals, hospitality professionals. You can enter into that program with uh, professional experience. You don't even need to have a bachelor's degree. Um, you can have one, of course, but uh, it's not necessary. Um, um, and this really takes you through a thorough understanding of everything having to do with the Mediterranean diet from um, history, geography, sustainability, um, uh, questions of tourism, question of hospitality also, and again, hands-on cooking classes. So um, come, and this is a, a conference we will be having in October also in Barcelona. Um, so come hang out with me. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful place to visit. So um, come do a master's starting in September until next June, um, and also plan on coming in October. Um, the last slide, um, or the last piece of information is to remind you to do your evaluations. Um, and then we will have lunch at 12.30 with book signings by Maricel, Diane, Suvir, and Fetlo, whom you've seen today. Um, the lunch will also be uh, prepared by your colleagues from their Kitchen Innovation Challenges this morning, for those of you who will be doing that. So thank you in advance.
advance. It was really wonderful yesterday to eat food you've made for us. Um, and now you can go on to your, uh, directly to your breakout sessions. Some here, Napa Valley Vintner Theater, the Food Business School classroom, and the kitchen. So thank you so much for being here. See you the rest of the morning, and see you next year, too.